Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet and the Emerald Planet TV, come to you from Washington, D.C. and the United States. As we look around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we become more dependent on the internet, the uh, internet of uh, everything, uh, the, the cloud, all these other technological advances, at the same time it opens up great vulnerabilities to run our societies. And so we have three people that are sitting here with us that are coming all the way from the state of Israel to talk about the cybersecurity and how to actually make the internet of things uh, very safe and to allow the earth to go forward as far as the development as we add two billion new people to the people on the planet. Sitting right beside me is Dr. Gabriel. He goes by the nickname of Gabby. Yes. Uh, the Siboni is head of the cybersecurity program. Hadas Klein Hi. is the cybersecurity forum manager. And Daniel Cohen, all the way at the end, a research fellow. And they're with the Institute of National Security Studies. And welcome to the Emerald Planet. Hi, sir. Glad to have you. Thanks for traveling so far to uh, be with us. Thanks for having uh, us. Uh, Gabriel, tell us a little bit about what is the Institute for National Security Studies. The Institute is an Israeli-based think tank that is uh, uh, focusing on, uh, on uh, the resilience of Israel and the national security of Israel uh, by um, improving the discourse, the, the discussion on strategic issues. And uh, we have a variety of um, issues that we are dealing with and we try to provide policy papers for our decision makers and also for the public. And um, uh, amongst them is the cybersecurity program which I had and we're dealing with um, how to improve cybersecurity both policy, both technology wise and to make sure that the discourse and the discussion in the state is, is more knowledgeable and more sound. And also too is how this fits into the world schema as oh, far yeah. as protecting the internet and uh, the, the, uh, everything that's going on as far as the cloud and all that. Hadas, you're uh, unique being a lady and involved in all of this. What are some of the information technology tools that are being used to make sure that everything is protected and have no interruptions as far as uh, the grid and all other aspects of information technology? Generally speaking, um, cybersecurity, it's not only about tools. It's uh, mainly about um, strategic issues, um, meaning, we're dealing with a defense um, by being able to um, have early warnings, be able to predict uh, um, um, uh, cyber attacks, uh, be able to prevent cyber attack, be, ever, be able to uh, react and recover on time. So um, in order to do this, we have to uh, have a lot of um, uh, intelligence we have to gather information, we have to analyze the information, uh, and then um, uh, we have to have uh, um, information coming from different uh, sources, from the outside world, like cyber threats and so on, uh, from the inside, in, inside the uh, inside the cooperation, like uh, SOC, Security Operation Center. Uh, we have information coming from uh, DLP, from Data Leakage Prevention uh, System, and so on. Then we take all this information, we fuse it, uh, and uh, in order to be able to see the big picture, in order to be able to um, uh, have a better situation, situational awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, looking at this, as we know that one of the, they say maybe World War III is gonna be fought in cyber, uh, not through bombs and missiles and tanks and all this. Uh, but one of the things that's the most vulnerable, of course, is the basic infrastructure you know, water, uh, energy, food, all these other kinds of things. So how does that fit into the studies that you're doing at the Institute? And what kind of tools or what kind of processes are you using to make sure that the basic infrastructure is protected, not only for your own country, but for all surrounding nations? First of all, I'll start with all surrounding nations. We're talking about sharing of information between them and working together and building trust trust also from uh, information. Uh, for that, you need good intelligence and uh, good capabilities to defend yourself and to share it with others. 
On the Israeli side, uh, we started pretty much early because we are threatened uh, by our enemies on the cyber issues also. So uh, already in 2002, uh, the Israel uh, a security agency started to protect the critical infrastructure, including the energy, water, and every other thing that you said, like gas and others. But there is a gap that we analyzed in our institute that is how to protect the civilian sector, because a critical infrastructure is not necessarily a, what we drink or how we drive or what we eat. It's also our finance, it's also the media because media has a lot of impact about the civilians. So how do you protect that? So in Israel, uh, the Prime Minister office decided uh, a few months ago to establish a cyber authority, national cyber authority, that will protect also the civilian side. Uh, it's a big uh, step, and Israel is always like a bit ahead of the others in uh, the re-establishment and establishment of the cyber security. Uh, and I know that a lot of countries are looking at now to see how it will be implemented in Israel and to see what they're going to step. Now in US also, there is now uh, talks about how to do it, how to do it right, because there are a lot of organizations that are involved in it, and there needs to be something that can coordinate between them. That's a really good point. Gabriel, if I can uh, follow up on this statement that Daniel just made, I think this is critical, is how do you protect the, the assets of the country itself, but also it's a very uh, dear thing about how do you protect the citizens. How do you bring collaboration? Because as Daniel was saying, there's many different agencies that be involved. You have the NGOs within the communities, defense and all that. So when you how do you mesh all of this together? Yeah, first of all, you know when there are people, you've got a lot of politics and other got ego and and we have we have plenty of those as you know not in Israel, in Israel. I don't no, believe no. that no yeah, we never. have plenty of those we can export some to the United States so uh, there is a big challenge in Israel to try to coordinate between various organizations and there is some inherent problems that we try to deal with and uh, cybersecurity is a, is a good issue to look at because we have so many organizations that are dealing with with this and uh, this is a big challenge I will tell you I, I won't tell the, the the audience with the details of the challenge let, let me just say it's a it's a substantial challenge in Israel. Yeah, it's a substantial challenge, but you know, through your institute, I know this is something that you really focus on and you work on is this collaboration. Yeah. How do you see collaboration being really almost an asset or a tool as far as being able to protect the country, but also the citizens and critical infrastructure? So collaboration of information, this is the basic thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you collaborate information on cyberspace, it means that you collaborate uh, information on attacks that had in collaborative information on how you prevented these attacks if you succeeded to prevent and you help your colleagues other colleagues so if 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 competing banks uh, can may collaborate on what happened to them in cyber security they will be better secure altogether so that's creating trust between competing entities that's uh, one issue the, the the DCOI I don't know if you would like right. me to mention it now because this is conference the defensive cyber operations and intelligence conference that we are holding now in in Washington DC is just for this very reason to make sure that we try to collaborate because cyber security does not have any borders and what would be more natural for Israel at least from our side to do it together with the United States mm -hmm. so so we love you guys, and uh, hopefully <laughs> it's it's uh, it's uh, recipro recipro <laughs> reciprocal. So. Uh uh, we are having this uh, uh, cyber security and we're dealing with these very issues. It's uh, national, uh, uh, critical uh, national infrastructure. We're dealing with how to protect the financial sector, uh, how to deal with the advanced cyber technologies that are advancing now because you know this classical uh, cyber defense tools are no more effective mm -hmm. and uh, how to deal with um, intelligence in cyberspace and also with strategic issues. So this is uh, what we deal and we, we look for this uh, It's cooperation. a broad platform. Yeah. Uh, now is looking at this cooperation between uh, Israel and the United States, and we're looking at it more than just the cyber aspect, but basic infrastructure, how you work on that together and develop of that, and then also to extend this as we go towards 2050. What do you see as some of the, the tools, the methodologies that are being used through your institute to uh, collaborate, but also to plan for the future? Gabby had mentioned uh, the DCOI, so this is a very good uh, beginning. Uh, of collaboration. Um, as Gabi said, and you know, as everybody knows, as, uh, uh, in the internet is a global thing, right? So uh, you need to approach um, the internet security, the cybersecurity, in a global way. Um, 
we do we, we, we do believe we believe that uh, the only way to enhance um, cyber uh, security is by collaborating. Firstly, um, private and public sector. This is locally, and then between uh, states. Um, this can be done with um, um, discussion platforms and uh, intelligence uh, um, sharing of uh, information and so on. Daniel, looking at the, the threats, both state and non-state actors, you know, we kind of think of it's nation to nation, but anymore, it's really the asymmetric aspect of this is in some ways the most dangerous and the most unpredictable. So how do you look at that and determine, you know, what path to follow or you just have to take everything as a broad blade in front of you? In the Institute, we are trying to like uh, take the tools, offensive tools against us and to, to like put them in like uh, what is a strategic tool, like, you know, like physical damage or something uh, simpler that can be used uh, against us. But then we see an example of a, a hacking group from Syria attacking the website or the Twitter of the White House and like planting like a message that uh, the president got uh, shot or something like that. And you, saw, you see Wall Street fall in that day. They did, it some, they did something really simple, but I think that we are not able in our days to really understand and identify the effect that uh, social media, cyber environment, you know, all of us look on our cell phones like every five minutes to check emails or to see the news. And it has such an effect on our culture that even like a simple tool being used by a terror organization can create a real, real damage against us. By saying that, we still need to remember that there are also states involved. And they're not only states, but there are states that sponsor terror also. And they can use them as proxies to do attacks against us. Uh, and to use the fact, effect that they don't have uh, any attribution to being taken uh, of it, because it's cyber. You don't, you not always know who is behind it. And like 99% of the time, you don't know who is behind it. So states can use terror organization to do it. And there are a few states that develop uh, a real, real effective uh, offensive cyber tools that are being used against other countries. We see it in uh, finance. We saw a steel plant getting blown in Germany like two months ago. So the evolution is going to more and more sophisticated. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Gabby, for being here. Siboni. Uh, we had Hadas Klein and then uh, Daniel Cohen. And uh, thank you for being with us as we're looking around the globe how we're going to be able to protect critical infrastructure as we create the Emerald Planet. I need a job. Necesito trabajo. I would like to speak English better. Me gustaría hablar inglés mejor. I want to be a U.S. citizen. Quisiera ser ciudadano de los Estados Unidos. For over 35 years. Por más de 35 años. The Hispanic Committee of Virginia has been serving our community. El Comité Hispano de Virginia ha estado sirviendo a nuestra comunidad. Job training and placement. Capacitación. Ayuda para conseguir trabajo. Education for children and adults. Educación para niños y adultos. Immigration, naturalization and medical referrals Ayuda para los procesos de inmigración y naturalización y orientación sobre médicos are a small part of what we do Son solo una pequeña parte de lo que hacemos For help, information or to volunteer Para ayuda, información o para ofrecerse como voluntario Contact the Hispanic Committee of Virginia Comuníquese con el Comité Hispano de Virginia Helping everyone participate more fully in American society Ayudando a todos a participar plenamente en la sociedad norteamericana Did you notice if you were missing half your kidney function? According to the National Kidney Foundation, 20 million people have chronic kidney disease and 20 million more may be at risk and not even know it. Anyone with high blood pressure, diabetes, or family history of chronic kidney disease is at risk. Early diagnosis is vitally important. To get the whole story, talk to your doctor and visit the National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org or call for a free brochure. Because when it comes to chronic kidney disease, you might not know the half.
to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, this is uh, Dr. Sam Hancock. We're coming to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And we're looking for ways as we go to the Internet of Everything, uh, cloud, big data, all these other uh, very sophisticated terms, but how do we protect the basic infrastructure of uh, every nation on the planet so that people can come and go to be able to expand, to have a normal life, at the same time to be able to protect their data, their intellectual property, and the infrastructure they're using for their own families, communities, and within their own country. I have a gentleman sitting uh, right beside me that's uh, very much involved in all this. This is Leo Frenkel, who is the CEO and co-founder of what's called Waterfall Security Solutions. I love this name. <laughs> I'm gonna make you, you explain you know, what that really <laughs> means, Leo. Okay. But anyway, welcome to uh, be with us on the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, Sam, and thank you for having me here. I'm glad you're here. Tell us a little bit about Waterfall Security Solutions and why such a unique name. Um, well, Waterfall Security uh, is an uh, industrial cybersecurity uh, um, technology provider. Our technology is uh, designed to uh, allow uh, industrial sites, control networks, um, to be safely integrated and to safely share information with external networks um, while defeating remote access controls, uh, remote access attacks, uh, which are the most problematic and most uh, threatening uh, attacks on, on the infrastructure today. Mm -hmm. um, the name, actually, of, of the company, Waterfall, um, represents the underlying basic feature of, of our product, which is uh, it allows data to be sent out of these networks, uh, but do not allow nothing to get back in. So in, in a sense, it allows data to go downstream mm -hmm. and nothing upstream, the same way as water travels through a waterfall mm -hmm. only, only, down, only downstream. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And we hear almost on a daily basis about hacking that's going on in, you know, all across North America, the European Union, Japan, many other countries. But at the same time, uh, people think, oh, you know, I've got my firewalls, I've got all these things, I'm perfectly safe, and of course they're instantly hacked. And uh, both on the military side and civilian, but also with even retail yeah. is not safe. So looking at all this, Lior, are we truly safe as far as the internet? And if no, why not, since we're spending billions of dollars to protect it? Okay, so, so first of all, nobody is never truly secure. Okay, it's, it's almost a, you know, a naive... You want to make that statement again? We're never truly secure? Nobody is ever, in any circumstance, truly secure. Okay, so okay. we need to have that as a basic premise. It's, okay. it's, it's a basic premise. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, and, and uh, it's, you know, the question is almost a bit naive, because you're, you're asking something that, that you don't ask in other circumstances. You know, you're, um, we'll get to that in, in, in a second. Um, the, 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 you know, the, real, the real truth or, or the fact is that if there's a site, a power plant, an offshore platform, you name it, that is specifically targeted by a capable adversary, okay, a nation state, they will succeed in hacking into it. Okay, it's period. There's no question there. Um, if they won't be able to get in this direction, they'll find another direction. Mm -hmm. it, it, if, if you want to think of it in, in a different way, it's not really a cyber security problem, it's an espionage problem. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and if, they, if they'll find an easy way to get in or to do whatever they want through a cyber attack, they'll do that. If, if they won't, they'll find another way. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's a bigger question. Um, and and to, to that extent, the, the game isn't really, um, you, you know, you can't fix the problem. You can't be more secure. You, you, know, you can't be tr truly secure. Uh, wh what you want to do is to raise the bar. Okay, you want, you, you want to raise the bar enough so you're not in a situation that everybody can get in. That it's so easy that, that everybody does that. You, you want to raise it high enough that maybe only these big mm -hmm. guys 
will be able to do it and hopefully even they won't or it will be really hard for them um, and 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 you know so so you you want to do that so you're not the easy target you want them to to if they target you maybe to fail or if they are just looking around so to say okay so they are defended well we'll we look some some yeah, else. so they're looking for softer targets uh, on an ongoing basis yeah now looking at uh, controlling or trying to protect the uh, networks uh, you know people are spending you know thousands millions of dollars for firewalls and various antivirus yeah. uh, software and we've established that nobody's truly safe a hundred percent uh, yet you want to raise the bar as high as you possibly can. So what, what is someone to do then if uh, you're trying to protect your network, the intellectual property, the basic infrastructure that's critical to, you know, home, uh, local community, nation? How do you go about doing that? Okay, well, f first of all, antiviruses and firewalls are r really good technologies and they're used for years and they're really, really good products and technologies out there. Um, at least fr from our perspective, protecting critical infrastructure, protecting you know industrial sites, both examples, both firewalls and antiviruses um, are technologies that were never designed to fit this situation. Oh, really? Yeah, mm -hmm. Th they were designed for IT networks, for information technology networks. Um, these network, the, the, the asset that they own is information. Mm -hmm. They are all about information. And you know, think of it, I'll give a simple example. Uh, let's assume um, you know, one of the big banks, their headquarters is damaged, is bombed. Okay? They have somewhere a backup of the information. They keep backups all the time. They have live backups. So let's say that, that you bomb their headquarters and all of their servers, everything is crashed. They'll, they have another site already ready They'll just pour all the information into it, and they're up and running in half an hour, half a day, whatever, because they kept the information, and they, they you know, you can back up information, you can make copies of information. It's, it's that type of asset. Our type of customers, industrial customers, their asset are physical entities, you know, the machinery. I see. So going from just the, the information, information technology to, to physical assets. Exactly. Okay, that, that, that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. Now, firewalls was, was, and antiviruses were not designed for that. They were designed for a situation where information, where the infrastructure can be damaged, but you need to keep the information. In, in our case, if you damage the infrastructure, you're done. You don't have a copy of your power plant. You, know, you don't have a backup a pipe for for your for your uh, um, offshore platform. Mm -hmm. you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You're losing business. Right. Okay. Well, looking at that, so what are some of the solutions that you have since you're really focused on physical assets, which is very different than you know most of us that operate in the world of yeah. uh, the internet of everything. So, uh, what what does your company provide then? Um, so, so, so as. You asked before, th there are you know, firewalls and antiviruses that were designed for IT networks. And when the uh, industrial world started to have cyber issues, which isn't so, so, uh, you know, so old news, um, new technologies were developed, uh, designed from scratch to fit these needs. I see. Okay, and, and w Waterfall is one of the leading company uh, which designed and, and produces such product and the technology is called uh, unidirectional security gateways, mm -hmm. uh, which are an alternative, a stronger alternative to firewalls for this uh, um, type of, of installation, for these types of customers. Um, and our technology allows um, a safe and secure way to, to um, share information from these networks outside to allow business processes and you know allow all the all the good stuff okay the, the industrial internet and and cloud services and um, la later on the in industrial internet of things oh, you need a lot of connectivity but you don't want all the risks so we we provide that secure connectivity um, in, in a way that that firewalls just 
just whenever designed just to don't do. do it. Yeah. Now, looking at this uh, unidirectional security technology, uh, what you're saying is, I, get, I think going again with your name, Waterfall is information out that's critical to the company itself. Yeah. And then, but not allowing things to come back upstream and all this. How do you actually do that? How do you close it off or how do you protect it so that those that are really looking to get into these uh, this critical infrastructure doesn't even know that you're there. Is that part of it? Where it's just like hiding the asset itself? Uh, well, it, it's really much similar to a physical waterfall. So we have a, 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 a physical, the, the, the product is based on hardware and software. Mm -hmm. Uh, the hardware um, creates a waterfall, like a virtual electronic waterfall of information. We have a high side and a low side, and there is with um, you know, ways of, of fiber optics and, and other technologies, um, we, we allow data to be sent from only one side of the hardware to the other. So it's, it's physically incapable of, of sending anything back. I see. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like really, th think of, of you have a network which has you know, information as water, and you put a waterfall from one side of it to another network, which is mm -hmm. you know, another pond or whatever yeah, right. downstairs. Um, and we allow data to be sent out, but nothing can go up. You know, it, it, it's physically incapable of going up mm -hmm. th through the firewall, mm -hmm. through, the, through the waterfall, sorry. Now, once you have this in place, this uh, unidirectional security technology, are there any other things that uh, your clients would need to make this operate and function in a most robust way? Of, of course, as 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 you know, I said at, at, at the beginning, you are never truly secure. Mm -hmm. now, we solved with our technology one of the biggest threats. Okay, you put our, you install our technology, and you have a really really good fence. Mm -hmm. uh, you can share information and nobody can get in. But you still have an insider threat. You still have threat that originate from within your infrastructure. Um, and you know, this is something that you're working with. We're just we, absolutely we, running out of time here, sure, yeah. uh, Lior. What do you see for the growth of Waterfall over the next 5, 10, 15 years? We've got to be quick. Five, uh, 15 years, I'll be retired, so ask my... <laughs> <laughs> no, five or 10, let's start with that. <laughs> five got to be ten. quick. Um, you know, w w we are expanding. The need is growing really fast. Um, perimeter security is one of the pillars of a security posture, and a strong perimeter is a need that we see growing in many infrastructure and many markets. And thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. Art a universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International, making a better America every day. Information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax free donation, contact CFREP at AOL.com. which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real-life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. We're back 
to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we look around the globe and we hear about all the cyber attacks and as we become more vulnerable as far as the energy supplies, water, food, all the basic infrastructure because of our dependence on the internet, we have to be able to somehow protect from hackers and terrorists around the globe. And how do we do that? And I have a gentleman sitting right here It's going to answer some of those questions for us. This is uh, Michael Piha. He is the marketing vice president uh, for Sasa Software. Right. And Michael, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, glad to have you with us. Tell us a little bit about what is Sasa Software. Sasa Software is a software company that is specialized in cybersecurity. We have developed a, a unique and innovative uh, security, additional security layer to make sure that the incoming data uh, is malicious free. Okay, looking at that, you know, everybody says we're completely secure, there's no problems, give us your money, give us your credit cards, give us your financial or your health data and all these other kinds of things. But every day you hear about, doesn't matter what country it is, people, institutions are getting hacked and uh, all kinds of breaches. So if everyone says they're secure, but all these hacks are going on to these very large multinational corporations, even the, the military, I mean, what's going on out there? Why is this going, why is this really happening? Well, that, that's a really a good question because what happened is that on one hand, the, the security layers that they are, all of them are very good, all of them are state of the art, very famous brands, they all were good for that for a time before. The hackers, the environment has been changed and it's changed significantly and very rapidly. The hackers and the attacks are becoming more sophisticated, more silent, and it makes the uh, life of the CIOs that are in charge of the security of the organization that relying on the current security layers much more difficult. Now the current security layers cannot cope with the new generation of the malicious malware. They need to become, to come with a new approach, innovative approach, thinking out of the box. Yeah, looking at that, I mean, that's uh, something that's much easier said than done, thinking outside the box. Everybody, you know, comes through, they have all their coursework, they're doing all the things that everybody else is supposed to be doing. But at the same time, they're still vulnerable, you know, to what's going on around the world. And many of these are coming out of countries that you would never think of that would be that sophisticated. Yet, yet some of them are actually, this is really part of their uh, international threat force, if you will, and gives them parity as far as much larger company countries or much more wealthy countries. So looking at the existing technologies and all the security is going on is what do they need to really do to protect themselves in this going thinking outside the box concept? Well, one, one thing that, uh, and that we have done in SASA software is when we looked what is out there in the market and in the market there are uh, exceptional good security layers which are most of them uh, share uh, three common elements they are all integrated in the network itself they are operating on the stream of data incoming data which we called online and they have to do some active procedures in order to trigger something in the incoming data for their uh, being able to make the detection so we understood that today the hackers are part of their being sophisticated. They learn the pattern and the way that those security layers are operating. They understood the sequence and now they learn how to overtake it. So by having those three elements in mind, we were thinking out of the box and we changed our philosophy and the way that we are working 180 degrees. First of all, we position ourselves outside of the network. We are working in the DMZ area. 
we encounter the threat before it entering into the network. Second, we understood that today the hackers are so sophisticated that we need to park aside the incoming data and to go as deep as possible into the file itself to identify mm -hmm. and neutralize any malicious. And you're doing this as it's coming in before it actually even gets into the system exactly, itself. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. third element is that we understood that the active procedures might accidentally trigger something and then the malware will be already in the network itself or the hackers are building their malwares in segments so you can run some active procedures but nothing will happen because it's only part of the formula mm -hmm. so what we have done we have built a full set of procedures it's and almost like a suite of procedures then. exactly mm -hmm. we are like a quarterback mm -hmm. we have a full set of procedures but all of them are passive we are not running the file at any stage. So the chances that something will go wrong is reduced is almost to zero. Yeah, and the whole thing is too, is then the, the hackers or the terrorist networks are not seeing your system in real time and able to assess, just like they're assessing whatever they're trying to attack. They have no way to assess because it's passive. Exactly. It's sitting there and just monitoring and seeing what's out there on the horizon then. Is well, that what you're... What we, you're we are explaining? Not, uh, not exactly. We are not monitoring the incoming data. What we are doing, we are checking 100% of the incoming data and we are treating those 100% incoming data as being infected. I so see. So your assumption it. is it's infected before it gets there. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's how we enforce all those procedures, manipulation, that all of them are passive on the incoming data and make sure that if there was a malicious embedded in the file, it being either eliminated or being neutralized. Mm -hmm. Okay. Looking at it, how, so this is something that you're saying is, is uh, quite unique, thinking outside the box. Uh, you're, of course, you're coming from the, the country of Israel. What, what's going on there that's different than what's happening, say, in the United States, NAFTA countries, and the European Union, as an example? Yeah. Well, look, in, in Israel, it's not secret that we are on a constant battle of, uh, of defense. It can be against symmetric warfare, asymmetric warfare, and, of course, cyber attacks. Now, for that, we have to all the time maintain a cutting edge technology in terms of the security. And one of the uh, main uh, motivation is uh, the IDF. And it's mandatory that everyone, each and every one of us have to serve in the army. So it creates a unique uh, situation where youngsters are being drafted to the army. Their part of their work is to uh, encounter cyber attacks, work in cyberspace, all in a very uh, uh, excellence uh, and professionality approach. Mm -hmm. And once they have finished the, the service, they are going back to the private or the public sector. And they enhance, they bring their professionality that they gained in the army, they bring it back to the private sector mm -hmm. and enhance the overall security approach in Israel. That's why I just read in the weekend newspaper before I left over to, to Washington that in 2014 there was almost a $7 billion buyout of startups uh, in Israel, Israeli companies. And the second thing that is very important also for us, because of the level of expertise and understanding the security needs, that's also what makes the life of SASA software and bringing the Gates kind of technology to the market much more easier because they appreciate and they embrace the technology. Well, looking at this whole notion of what you call gate scanner, uh, this is a technology you've developed. So how is that different from what's being used in the United States and in other countries around the globe? Well, the, I think that the, 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 the biggest difference um, as I mentioned, is the way of thinking. You have to understand 
that the security in any organization is made like an onion. It's based on layers, layers, layers and layers and layers. That the whole purpose of those layers is to protect the essential uh, assets of the organization. Now, by having said that, that's important that the security layer, the first security layer, will be something that will encounter the threat in such a way that it will be able to go as deep as possible into the incoming, uh, into the coming files, the incoming data. Mm -hmm. And this is the gate scanner. The gate scanner allows the organization to enhance the overall security by having it as the first security layer. Now, in Israel, it's being appreciated and understood first-year customers in Israel are using the gate scanner technology, starting from governmental agencies through state critical infrastructure, uh, hospitals, clinics, banks, everybody yeah, is using it. Mm -hmm. Variety of, of uh, sectors. Overseas, still they are uh, adopting the active approach, like send various sandboxes and other solutions or other uh, security measures that are, they are all good. But they have to become a secondary and third layers mm -hmm. because they cannot deal with the current uh, threats. So that, that, in other words, you're getting it uh, before it even gets in exactly. to the system itself. What kind of organizations, or we're running out of time, a quick question, yes. uh, what kind of organizations can benefit from the gate scanner? Well, um, and I have one more question, so let's be quick. Okay, so definitely a state critical infrastructure like power plants, nuclear power plants, airports, uh, uh, municipalities uh, are, are a potential customer for the gate scanner. Uh, healthcare organizations like hospitals, ERs, for example, just imagine a shutdown in an ER, right. what, what can happen? Um, and of course, uh, all the defense uh, organization that can definitely exceed Next five, 10 years, where do you see uh, Sasa? Software. Well, we believe, uh, I believe. 10 seconds. 10 seconds. 10 years from now, we will be a, an integrated part of any organization that is out there in the market. It's fantastic. That's a good summary. And uh, Michael Pia, thank you for being with us, the marketing vice president of Sasa Software. And thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to determine how to protect your assets as we create the Emerald Planet. In the smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Fire. Cause there's nothing very funny about the top right. Nothing very nice. A whole is mine. So if a gorgeous force is what you desire, don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go! Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow! Oh, oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People! The flood is imminent! Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first.
to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you, as we look around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are moving us forward as we go to 2050. And as we go to a planet of 9 billion people, how are we going to be able to provide all the basic uh, infrastructure that they need, but at the same time to make sure that it's safe and secure? And this is really one of the major challenges that not only do uh, homes and communities have, but also states and national governments. And we have two gentlemen here that are coming, uh, talking about uh, actually two different organizations. Moshe Bueller is uh, CEO of IIA, and then Dermiti Shaversman, who is a Director of Technological Intelligence at SenseSci. I like that name, and we're going to have to talk about that in a minute. But Moshe <laughs> and D Dimitri, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Glad to have you with us. Moshe, tell us a little bit about uh, IIA, what it is that it does, and what kind of services that you're providing. Thank you. IIA, it's an international investigation agency that provides investigation around the global. We specialize in investigation in the finance sector, in the water sector, and also in the cyber sector. We provide solution to any organization, to any sector, and to any people who needs our services if they were attacked or if they need information, and we provide information before operation. That's what the IIA is doing. Yeah, and this is something that's really critical, and uh, Moshe, we talked about this before you came on TV with us, is that this is something that uh, really now there's uh, billions of dollars being expended, but at the same time, people are not feeling really secure, and that's where you come in and to play. Uh, Dimitri, looking at uh, what is CTI and how does CTI you know, fit into this whole schema as far as protecting and uh, making sure that systems are really protected? So CTI stands for Cyber Threat Intelligence and there are different ways to implement that. Uh, one of such is collecting bad uh, IP addresses, right? Uh, and collecting, creating lists of such bad IP addresses that can later be incorporated into very security um, organizations or security uh, devices that different organizations and corporations have. Um, by thus enabling them to enhance and better protect their organizations and their assets. Now there are different aspects to CTI. We were talking about some of them, the more popular ones as I mentioned were the technical indicators. And some of them was actually collecting intelligence as opposed to what kind of campaigns are going out there, uh, what kind of threat actors that the organizations have to deal with. So you're reaching out and trying to draw things in in advance of anything ever even happening. Exactly, precisely. Uh, and that can really focus the organization in terms of where they need to put their money to and how they need to enhance their security in a better way, in a more precise way, as opposed to just spending, uh, as you mentioned, a lot, a lot of money and not feeling secure at the same time. Now, looking at this, let me follow up on this, Dimitri, if you don't mind. Uh, looking at this, uh, reaching out, you said, you talked about, I believe I heard, bad IP addresses. Correct. And you want to gather those. Now, why do you want to gather those and what's the importance of that versus having it so that uh, you're just you know, put them aside or try to, you know, lock them in a box or, you know, destroy them. I mean, why do you want to gather those and what's, what's really the purpose of that? The thing is, you see, there's just so many of them and we're talking about malicious tools or different threat actors creating them and we're talking about dozens, hundreds uh, and they keep on popping out, they keep on populating uh, and the, the malicious tools or malware as, as it's being called by the official terminology keeps on communicating with that. Those are the CNC, those are command and control servers that the malware communicates with, transfers data, and basically that's how most of the leakage happens. It's almost like a sleeper. It's, it's just it, sitting there and gathering in whatever way. comes by. It's just yes. trolling. It's, it could be a sleeper for data leakage. It could be for remote administration tools, what have you. Uh, but you can't really go and try because the process of trying and, and stopping or taking down those IPs is just hideous. Mm -hmm. uh, and the better way is to try to stop it by uh, various intrusion detection systems or prevention systems. You just block them, just like a firewall does. Mm -hmm. in other locations. So it's easier to populate those in an identification or a blocking machine than to try and go out and, and shut down by 
just going one at a time. So it's like breaking a code and just monitoring it so you actually know what's going on out there and just let it continue to do what it's doing as long until as it's not it becomes affecting, yeah. really malicious. Until it, so that it won't affect your organization because mm -hmm. the IPs are there um, and, and they keep on being populated. It's just the ability to recognize, spot them, and then better protect your organization. Uh, mostly looking at your uh, IIA, how does that actually go into protecting this uh, critical uh, infrastructure and the sustainable and resiliency of critical infrastructure that's out there, whether it's military, commercial, mm -hmm. residential? Well, let's say that if you will not have the IAA in the world and you will not have a reaction or solution for a reaction, we will not have investigator who investigate on cyber. So always to live and to build an organization only to defense, you will always lose. So what we are giving to the companies or the organization who hired us, we give a solution from the first second until the end, it means we are collecting the information, we are understanding the motivation of the hacking, we are getting and gathering information and intelligence for companies like my friend who's sitting here, and then we provide the most important issue that you even, as a simple guy need, is a solution who are those people? How do we eliminate them? Mm -hmm. We are investigate, we keep an eye on them, we are traveling after them, we are near them, we are smelling them, mm -hmm. and we react. Mm -hmm. This is what we do. So in a sense, it's like a combination of the police, the military, and stealth kinds of activities. Is that, you're just putting the it all IIA, together as a package? The IIA, is a private international investigation agency. You don't need, as an organization, to contact the CIA mm -hmm. or contact the police. If you need really a response, you will contact the IIA. We will build you the strategic I see. picture, mm -hmm. the strategic plan, how to react from the first second to the last second. Mm -hmm. This is our job. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, usually I have this very upfront, Dimitri, but you noticed I've left your name and the evolution, right. the ethos of that uh, since Psy. What does that really mean? But then what are the different approaches? You mentioned some of those that you're using as far as going out and identifying these bad actors to protect the clients that you have, you know, whatever it may be, whether it's government or non-governmental. Right. But why? Why uh, the different approaches and what is some of the complexity that you're faced with and what you're doing with Sensei? So uh, actually it's very interesting because there's a, I, I find a direct correlation between our name and how we approach CTI. And Sensei stands for sensing cyber. Um, and as I mentioned, there are different people that collect intelligence in, in, in different methodologies. Uh, you have automated tools that we also utilize in our company, but we've developed something, a sister company of ours that we sprung up from, developed something uh, which we call virtual human. Uh, and it's- Once more, virtual? Virtual human. Human. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, human intelligence, virtual human intelligence. Um, so we have live analysts, we have more than 10 different languages in-house and those analysts really sense cyber. They sense the intelligence um, because we believe that there's a need to actually understand who you're talking to on the other side, uh, who are the threat actors, how to approach them. You need to really understand the culture, you need to understand the language, the nuances, the jargon, things that automated machines just cannot do. Those enabling us to provide a bigger picture for our clients in terms of what assets out there might be compromised, what's within the spectrum of the sector. Let's say it's a financial uh, company and they're interested to understand who's after the financial sector in general, or what kind of trends out in the world, um, what are the, the threat actors are looking for, uh, what are they trying to sell. There's a big, big economic ecosystem in place where there's uh, selling and buying of malware. 
Um, so this is all in this gray and, and black market. Precisely. The underbelly of the whole internet itself. Precisely. And mm -hmm. the ability to go in and to collect what's in the open intelligence, as we call it, the OSINT, open source intelligence, um, and to collect what's out there in forms of research, whether it's just academic research. But if you take that and connect to certain something that happened in an underground <coughs> forum where we have our own entity operating, um, to connect all that into one story and to kind of picture that storyline and pitch it to our clients that's something only a live analyst with some with the proper background and the linguistic skills can do with the support of proper technology that so developed in house. So really what you're saying then Dimitri it's not only just the technology software hardware of all this but you really have to have the human assets 100% that, that really can react to and have this intuitive nature which you're not going to get through a cyborg or some kind of exactly. uh, mechanical actor. Not just through a system you need to have an analyst that can provide the backstory because in a lot of occasions our customers say well why us? Or what's the backstory behind this or that attack? What are they after? Are they after my assets? Or after their, their fame and glory? Because they're different, even within the spectrum of threat actors, there are different groups. You've got cyber criminals, you've got hacktivists. Mm -hmm. Each and every one has their own gain and their own purpose. And the ability to see that, to analyze it, and to sense it, that's what we do at Sensei with our analysts. Moshi, with I uh, looking at this and we're getting close on time, what are some of the th situations that you've managed and how have you responded uh, to those situations so you protect your client? I'll give you a very beautiful sample. A very big car maker, a European car maker, had an attack. Somebody go inside his computer and take out the samples of the cars that they will manufacture in 2018. Do you know what kind of a disaster is it if a big car manufacturer in America want to do something secret for the people in America in 2018 and somebody hack it? So what we do, we immediately respond. We saw this in Twitter, somebody hack it. So we arrive to the company, we gather information, we find out with companies that get information underground, IPs. We take information we have from our analyze. Then we build an attack. And what we do, we are gathering information about this guy. We found him. Mm -hmm. And we immediately saw that this guy doesn't stay in Europe. And trust me, he didn't stay even in China. We find him in Indonesia. And he was a French guy, but we eliminated him immediately. We provide a good service to the biggest car maker in Europe. That's what we do even to the energy sector and all other sectors that we are working for. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for thank you. being with us. Thank Moshe you for Bueller, having us. And we have uh, Dimitri sitting right beside him. And thank you for being with us, dear viewers, as we look around the globe as we create the M1.